Uh, thank you, uh, Barbara, and thank Deb, Deb Steele, who isn't here, for getting me here, and the rest of uh, the steering committee for inviting me. Here, this is the pointer. You press, and, and for back and forth. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about estimating animal abundance and distribution and I'm going to cover a, a variety of different techniques that can be used for this. But first I wanted to talk a little bit about why we need to estimate abundance and, and obtain distribution information. One obvious reason is that trends in abundance are used to assess human impacts and it's one of the strongest tools we have to determine um, whether impacts are occurring because a lot of the impacts are invi otherwise invisible to us. And it's also valuable to identify uh, threatened populations. Absolute population size is also used to assess whether um, the known numbers of human caused mortalities uh, such as fisheries bycatch um, are, sus are sustainable. Um, we know more or less what um, population growth rate is, um, can, is, is within the realm of possibility and if the mortality is greater than that then we can assume that it's uh, not sustainable. Uh, distribution data allow us to determine um, areas of the greatest overlap between human activities and whale abundance and also whale Absolute abundance is critical to understanding the ecosystem role of cetaceans, something that uh, Lisa Balance talked um, about this morning. So how do we go about estimating abundance? Well, there's four main reasons, four main methods. One is we kill them. Uh, no, really, that's, that's actually how they used to do that. Um, whales um, were killed in the process of whaling. Um, catch per unit effort declined. Um, the rate of decline of catch per unit effort was related to how many whales were killed. And that's how you found out how many whales there used to be before you killed them all. <laughs> that was not very effective. And we've developed some more effective tools recently. Um, Distance sampling has evolved to be a very powerful tool for estimating the abundance of whales um, using line transect surveys from ships, boats, and aircraft and towed and stationary acoustic methods. Um, Shore-based counts can be used, and I'll talk about that briefly for a number of uh, whale species. And mark recapture um, abundance uh, Abundance can be estimated by mark recapture using uh, techniques such as uh, photo identification and genetics to identify specific individuals. Um, most of my work has been um, on ship-based line transect surveys, so I'll talk about that first. Um, there are a variety of different um, approaches used. Um, most of them have been done from medium to large size vessels. It's very difficult to do this sort of work from very small vessels because the animals often react to the vessel before you see them, which violates one of the primary assumptions. Um, from the largest vessels, um, such as this 53 meter NOAA research vessels, you can put 25 power binoculars and get a really great range for detecting animals and seeing them before they react to the vessel. Typically we use two um, binoculars mounted on the flying bridge deck of those vessels. Um, here you can see just some of the transect lines from a 10-year period of study from, from uh, our Southwest Fishery Science Center surveys. Um, these were done in, in summer and fall of the years 86 through 96. And it's just a figure I had. Uh, the two main study areas are the Eastern Tropical Pacific, this area here, and the U.S. West Coast, this area up here. Um, shown here are 20,000 kilometers of track line miles um, in a study area that's over 25 million kilometers squared. Um, the, the methods that you use for ship-based line transect surveys is typically to define your study area and then lay out track lines that systematically cover that um, study area so as not to concentrate your track lines in areas where you have known abundance of one species or another species. Um, you don't need a big white boat to do these surveys even though we like to use them. Um, 
You can use aircraft, and aircraft are particularly effective for very near shore species. We use them for harbor porpoise. Um, Simon probably recognizes this platform. It's uh, the platform on the Catalyst, uh, a sailing catamaran that uh, uh, Steve Dawson and Liz Sloten used for estimating the abundance of Hector's dolphin in uh, New Zealand. This is a river boat that was used for line trans transect surveys of river dolphins in the Colombian Amazon. And this is another river boat that was used for line transect surveys of uh, the dear departed Baiji and uh, finless porpoise in the Yangtze River. Um, critical to um, line transect methods is the necessity to estimate the distance at which you can see animals. And the critical distance is this distance D, the distance from the track line that you're surveying on to where the animals are. You can estimate it by estimating the radial distance um, and estimating this angle theta. The radial distance is, can be calculated using reticles in the binoculars, um, particularly um, effective with those high power, 25 power binoculars. Um, Transect surveys can be thought of in the simplest case as a strip transect, a method that assumes that all animals are seen out to some distance W, and then you don't count anything that's further than W from the transect line. So the red animals are not counted, the black animals are. The density of animals can be thought of as the number of animals seen divided by the areas searched. The number of animals seen is the number of sightings times the group size, and the area searched is this transect length times two times the, the half width here. Line transect is really just a very simple extension of strip transects. It loosens this assumption. It only assumes that all animals are seen on the track line, on the transect line. Um, so I'm representing those as the black dots again. But there are also some animals on the, that are missed um, that are within this truncation distance, W. Um, and then you actually estimate the fraction missed by fitting a line, um, a curve, through the, the distributions of perp perpendicular sighting distance. Um, fortunately, some very clever people, including Jeff Lake and Len Thomas, have written software to make this sometimes complicated mathematical process of estimating effective strip width uh, simple and plug in. Um, since a lot of my recent work has been acoustic, I'd be remiss in not mentioning acoustic line transect methods, um, but they are very difficult and we're just at the inception and there are certain limitations. Um, as um, Kate said earlier, um, Acoustic methods depend on the animals themselves uh, making noise, and if they're not making any noise, then you'll miss them. Um, also critical for using acoustic methods for line transect is having some method to estimate the distance that the animals are that you're detecting off the transect line. Um, this illustrates one of our methods of doing that is, and that is just estimating bearing angles, and these bearing angles changes over time and where all the bearing angles converge, that's your estimate of the, the position of the animals. Um, probably the greatest barrier to using this is not knowing what fraction of time animals are vocalizing, and so this method works best for those species like sperm whales that are fairly compulsive echolocators all the time when they're diving. Another approach um, to particularly well-behaved whale abundance estimation is just standing on a cliff or sitting in a comfortable van in this case, whoops, on a cliff face um, and counting whales as they go by. Uh, this is uh, John Durbin and I, I think that's Dave Weller um, counting gray whales off the coast of California. Um, in an ideal situation you'll have two independent platforms watching whales. Some whales will be detected by both platforms these two whales were detected by both platforms. Some whales will be detected only by one, and some might be missed by both platforms. 
Uh, the idea here, though, is not to count every whale because that's quite impossible, but it's to estimate the rate at which w whales are migrating by as a function of uh, date and time during this migration, fitting a curve to that, and then estimating the total abundance, again, using some what can be complicated mathematics. Um, I won't bore you with the tedious details there, but uh, it can be done. Um, some animals may be too far offshore to be seen practically in any situation, and then you need to some independent method, for instance, aerial surveys, to estimate the offshore distribution of whales. The next topic I want to talk about is the estimation of whale abundance using an entirely different technique. That's um, mark recapture, um, and the most common method for mark recapture work for whales is photo identification. Um, this was um, the splash study that John fortunately already provided the introduction for, and this is um, members of the steering committee and other people who were particularly instrumental in this. And I say 400 of our closest friends because in fact this was a very large scale study. Um, mark recapture um, using photo identification is based on the fact that if you get a really good photograph of a humpback whale fluke, um, it's distinctive and you can recognize that fluke if you ever see it again um, ever in its life. Um, there are other techniques that can be used. You can actually mark whales, but that doesn't, that's not very practical. Um, but from genetics, you can also uh, di distinguish individuals very um, distinctly for, for their, their life. As John said, this SPLASH project was a collaboration of researchers using a variety of platforms, but the same basic sampling techniques throughout the North Pacific. Um, John showed this photograph, or this image of the, the, the migrations, and just showing how complicated the, the migration situation is, that animals from, for instance, the islands off Mexico cross with the animals from the Hawaiian Islands when they're going to their, their separate feeding areas. Um, in Splash, we managed to get um, about 18,000 high quality fluke photographs uh, from all of these areas. Um, the idea of mark recapture estimation is pretty simple. Um, what you want to know if you, for instance, go out in your first year, oops, and you sample um, photographically Six, around 1,600 animals, um, you want to know, well, what is the total number of animals? If you go back out again and you sample uh, photographically 2,700 animals and you find that 236 um, were sampled before, then you know that the ratio of this 15, the 1,600 to the total population size is roughly equal to the ratio of this 236 to this 2700 and you can just rearrange these formulas to solve for the total population size and in this case which was one year of the splash sampling uh, our population estimate was about 18,000 whales. Uh, this simple estimator is called the Peterson mark recapture estimator. Um, there are some assumptions like the population is closed, there's no birth or deaths and every individual has an equal probability of of being sampled. There are a variety of other mark recapture models out there that relax some of these assumptions. Um, also, if, if you can't find a formula that, that ag exactly matches your sampling um, protocol or your, 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 your animal population, you can use computer simulation modeling to correct for the bias that would result and which is a, an approach that we used for the splash analysis. In a very few limited number of cases, um, you're lucky enough to apply two methods independently um, to estimate the abundance of some animal population. And this was the example that John Callum Kiedis gave of um, estimating blue whale abundance using both line transect methods and mark recapture estimates. And as he alluded to earlier, the mark recapture estimates um, were very close to the line transect estimates in the early years of the, the 1990s. 
but they started to diverge starting in about the year 2000 and from that point onward the mark recapture estimates were stable or possibly gradually increasing whereas the line transect estimates decreased markedly. This concerned us greatly as, as you might imagine either it meant that our techniques were not working correctly or something was perhaps cat catastrophically happening to the blue whale population. Well it turned out through additional investigations um, that it was neither of these that in fact these two methods are measuring slightly different things. The line transect estimates represent the number of animals within a defined study area, in this case the U.S. West Coast, whereas the mark recapture estimates were actually estimating the entire population that passed through that study area, including animals that may have been feeding largely outside that study area. And upon further investigation, we found that um, a lot of animals had sh simply shifted their feeding from California to um, the Gulf of Alaska um, and off of uh, British Columbia. Um, I want to just talk uh, one final point about how do I get started if you want to do abundance estimation. I think the John hit on the, the the, the key requirement is to initiate collaborations. Almost any meaningful abundance estimation study is going to be more complicated than something that can be carried out by one person and collaborations are an absolute essential. Um, another essential is having a good study design. If your design is faulty all your good effort can be lost. It's in imperative that you consult with experts and people like Len Thomas are just dying to help people like you get started. Uh, sorry Len. Uh, <laughs> as I've shown there are different methods. Um, different methods work be better with different species um, in different areas and given different budgets and get your 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 whatever method you use get your design peer-reviewed before you even start doing the analysis or the the, the field sampling. Um, read the literature um, there are lots of good examples uh, that you can follow and it's important finally to consider safety any work done on small boats um, or from aircraft is intrinsically dangerous and you have to consider those risks try to minimize them and know the limits of yourself and your equipment. I have a number of references um, and I will PDF this talk and the talks will be put on the website right or someplace where you can access them and you can uh, and look at this uh, information to, uh, to find out uh, more details. Thank you very much.